Hey, this is Brett, and you're watching Brett and Some Books. Today we are continuing Boxcar Bertha, an autobiography. This is chapter 10. Several months before my mother learned from a visitor at home colony that my father, Walker C. Smith, was still in New York operating a little radical bookstore and had sent on his address to me, suddenly I wanted something that belonged to me. I had never seen him. One morning I rang the bell at his little basement flat on 113th Street, which was both his shop and his home. A short man, middle-aged, rather vague in manner, but with intense eyes looking out under shaggy eyebrows, answered the door. He did not ask my errand. Won't you come in? He said pleasantly. I followed without saying anything, and as I entered the room from which he had come, I paused before speaking to examine it. Everything in the room was dirty and in great disorder. Stacks of old newspapers rose from the floor nearly to the ceiling. Pictures of Ingersoll, Walt Whitman, Charles Darwin, Haeckel, Tolstoy, Proudhon, and Voltaire hung on the walls. There was a rack of pamphlets with sale prices on them, 10, 25, and 50 cents. When he saw that I was looking at the books, he went back to his writing without saying a word. Finally, I came over to him and put a hand on his shoulder. Mr. Smith, I asked, do I look like anybody you know? He squinted one eye at me and finished writing a sentence to its end. There's something familiar about you, he said, and something pleasant, but I can't place you. Have you ever been to any of my dinners? He was the secretary of the Rising Sun a famous dining and discussion club. I sat down on the edge of his desk, then he put aside his pen. Don't you know who I am? I asked. I'm your daughter. Didn't you ever care if I existed? Why haven't you tried to get in touch with me? He looked up at me with mild interest, but no surprise or special enthusiasm, and certainly nothing which remotely resembled embarrassment. Your name's Bertha, isn't it? He asked. I felt let down by his casual air and answered him shortly. Yes, Boxcar Bertha. Where did you get hold of such a name? Mother told me that when I was a child and I couldn't be found anywhere else, she could always find me in a boxcar. Kids began calling me Boxcar Bertha and the name has just hung to me. Even in school in Seattle, they never called me Bertha, but Boxy. I paused and tried to pierce the veil of his face and discover what I, what thoughts and feelings were behind it. But so far as I could see, he was feeling nothing. He would have felt, he would not have felt if any other strange young woman had come and perched him, herself at his desk. It annoyed me and I began to scold him. Tell me why you've never written my mother, I asked. Why didn't you ever try to find us? I've been very much interested in other people's children, he said. You didn't need me, they did. Your mother was able to be a father and mother to you. Many women are not able to be even a mother. Your mother and I liked the idea of having a child. We had one, that was all there was to it. I wanted to go, so I went. But don't you think I needed a father as much as I do a mother? I protested. He laughed heartily. All men are your fathers and your brothers, he said, and all children will be your sons and daughters. He told me I was welcome to stay with him a while, and I moved in that day and slept on a cot in a stuffy room filled with books and papers. He asked no questions of me. There were two men living in the flat with us. One was Morton Fleming, a man of fifty who was compiling material for a book on the history and use of violence in solving social problems. The other, an Englishman, almost 70, named Burton, did nothing, so far as I could see, but read. He had been in the English free thought and labor movement with Anne, Annie Besant and Bradlaugh. My father and these men were bachelors and bibliophiles. They lived in and for books. I was with them only two weeks in such somber, intellectual, honest, thoughtful, and non-earthly atmosphere, I would not have believed existed anywhere. 
They lived simply and frugally on a hundred dollars a month for three. Nothing was superficial or vulgar in that flat. Nobody ever wasted a word. There was no smoking or drinking, no phonographs, no music. Every Sunday morning, promptly at eight o'clock, a woman named Emma Wayne came to the house to have breakfast with them. She was a thin, worn-out blonde of 40 with a high forehead and light blue eyes behind thick glasses and beautiful hands that were always calm. She was a designer for a fashionable dress house. And so you're Bertha, she greeted me when we when introduced. I have been taking Sunday morning breakfast with your father for almost 20 years. She took my arrival in the same casual way that my father had. Both were friendly, but neither seemed really interested in me as a person. It was obvious that they were lovers, and Emma said, Why, of course, when I asked her. I, and she added, with no embarrassment, that for the last ten years she had been sleeping with Morton also. My father and his friends were dreamers. They believed that they could write books that would remedy all the wrongs of the world. They would not let anything disturb them. They seemed to regard sex as purely a physical function. Neither Father nor Morton seemed to feel any sense of possessiveness about Emma, nor any jealousy. She was a companion to both of them and filled an important need for them both. Neither seemed at all to mind sharing her with the other, nor did Emma seem to feel that there was anything strange about living with both of them this way. But it seemed strange to me. As much as I believed in freedom, and as much as I practiced it, there was something about the lengths to which she thought, to which, there was something about the lengths to which the thought of these three when it went, which appalled to me and made me feel out of place among them, an intruder. One day I asked my father whether he had any other children and he said that he had one, but he had completely lost touch with it, and he didn't know where it was or its mother was. But how do you justify yourself? I exploded. How do you and the other free men justify yourselves in having children and then going off and deserting them? Your explanation that you're busy and you have more important things to do, and you're quoting Jesus, who is my brother and who are my children, doesn't satisfy me. Suppose I hadn't had such a wonderful mother to look after me. I might have been in an orphan asylum with thousands of other helpless children. Doesn't your creed take in responsibility and family loyalty? How about Emma? She's been serving you men for 20 years and has to work hard for a living every day. Now she's just worn out. Fathering and supporting children was never my function in life, he answered calmly. I never felt that it was the thing I wanted to do. I belong to the class of men who are not fathers and who get no joy in supporting a family. Bernard Shaw says, a married man will do anything for the family. It sounds well, but it means nothing. There are fathers and there are educators. I am an educator. According to Meter, there are two different types of men and women. In women, the uterine or maternal type, those who are mothers, who want to be mothers, and the clitoral or sexual type, those who want to be men, many men. The men are also of two types, the orchidic and the phallic type. The orchidic type corresponds to the uterine type. This male is a good father. He is the home lover, the monogamist. The phallic type is like Morton and I. We need women. Any kind of women will do. We don't want a wife or a family. It is very difficult to say which type gives the most to the world. So far, I don't think any of us has, have succeeded very well. This last war and the statistics from the criminal insane and the charity organizations demonstrate that no one should be very proud of what any of us have accomplished. But what is your solution, Father? I asked him. What is your goal? My dear Bertha, there are no solutions to the problem of life. There are no goals. You just go on living and loving and doing the best or the worst you can. I have lived and I have had all the women that I've wanted. I've struggled and fought for my principles. When it was necessary, I went to jail or starved. I haven't denied myself anything I wanted. As I grew older, 
I find I want less. I have found that most of the things I used to struggle for were not worthwhile. I've cut down my needs. You see us here living a very simple but comfortable life. There's no goal, no heaven ahead. I've withdrawn from many things. We must enjoy every day and make the most out of every experience. There are no certainties, no eternal verities, no reward. In the past, I had joy in struggling and agitating and going to jail. And now I can get more out of life living simply with my friends. I've been working all my life, studying and writing. I gave up lecturing 10 years ago. I no longer have confidence in the spoken word. A great many people who have heard me were moved by what I said. I found out that you can stimulate people to hate, to do stupid things. Audiences, the mobs, can never think straight. Thinking is an individual process. It must be done in silence and humility. You can make wars, incite labor riots, provoke violence and destruction, and drive the mob to lynch by what you say. But no speech ever made a people gentle or honest. There are thousands of sermons and inspirational, political, radical, and revolutionary speeches made daily. They never change the behavior of people. I doubt if an oration, no matter how powerful, ever soothed the frenzy of a mob or neutralized the hatred of a group of Southerners who are determined to lynch a black man charged with rape. What would you say to a mob of Georgians to prevent them from lynching a victim? Can you appeal to their pity and say that this man has ten dependent children? Would it do any good to appeal to their patriotism with, if you lynch this man, you will discredit your state? Or to say, if you kill this man, you'll be labeled murderer? Do you think it would be any good if we went down to the owners of the department stores and said, we have here figures compiled by Columbia University and the Labor Department in Washington. They clearly demonstrate that no woman can live a respectable life and have all of her needs satisfied for less than $18 a week. You know what their answer would be? Suppose we went to the coal company and the steel mills and said, gentlemen, the men that are working for you have families and children. They need so much a week. If you spoke with tears in your voice and brought a dozen hungry families with you to prove your statements, would it help? So far, force has always won. I like to believe that thinking enough on the subjects of brotherhood and cooperation will eventually bring them about, but we can only hope. Mutual interests and enlightenment will only pave the way for a new society. I agreed with so much that my father said, yet he and his thoughts and the way he lived left me feeling confused and helpless. I could not accept his complete lack of a sense of responsibility toward his women and his offspring or his complete impersonality. I felt constantly out of place there and so I decided to go. When I told father I intended to leave, he merely said, all right, come and see me any time except he smiled at me whimsically, not on Sunday mornings. Without any plan or any idea of where I would go next, I walked to the 59th Street and crossed over the Queensboro Bridge. I was delighted by the towering office building stretched out in a magnificent skyline. Tugboats puffed below me in the river like earnest purposes. Directly below the middle of the bridge, I saw Welfare Island with its house of correction and penitentiary, its almshouse where thousands of old men and women were wish waiting to die, the Metropolitan Hospital, Hearts Island with its delinquent boys and girls, women's prison with its prostitutes and dope fiends were all close by and seemed to attract me. I walked slowly back towards Manhattan, wondering where I would spend the night if it had never occurred to my father to ask me that when I left, I walked down First Avenue to 26th Street. There was a massive Bellevue Hospital. At the next corner was a group of forlorn looking men and women slowly wending their way down towards the river. I joined the procession. Knock their shit off. They were old, many of them foreign looking. Some of them were on crutches. They joined a line at a large seven-story building, Marsh Municipal Lodging House. 
Around the corner of the building was a door marked Entrance for Women. I took my place in the line. That's the end of chapter 10. Please like and subscribe.